Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. So in the 1920s in U.S. America, with the advent of automobiles and telephones and these things that we call modern conveniences, a new social theory was developed to help people cope with what seemed to be a smaller and shrinking world. With the increase of our ability to travel and communicate over greater and greater distances, the theory said our friendships and acquaintances would also expand geographically. And we would have more connections, more friendships, more social circles, and they would be much broader. And with the expansion of our social circles, the world would become increasingly interconnected. And I think that theory has held up over the past hundred years. I think we can see that we have friendships, relationships over further and further distances. Personally, I've got friends all across the United States. Many of you do as well. Because I've traveled some, I've met a lot of people along the way. And even if you haven't traveled, you know somebody who has traveled and has relationships far and wide. The people you know, know others. And then turn those people know others, and they know others, and that whole friend of a friend of a friend thing means that we are all interconnected in a very large web of interpersonal relationships. The theory is popularly known as six degrees of separation. And the gist of that says that nobody is any more than six personal relationships from anybody else. Now, whether that's exactly six or seven or eight, I don't know. It's nearly impossible to prove. But the principle holds up. The people you know know other people who know other people. And in that way, we are all intertwined in a tremendous network of personal relationships. So think about that fact for a minute. Think about this web of relationships that we all live in and tie that thought with these principles of grace and truth and mercy and hope that the Bible talks about regularly. Who are we, ought, who are we supposed to be? How ought we live, and what ought we do to make the world a better place? How can I live my life in such a way as to have a positive impact in my community and on the kingdom of God? We're all connected, and we, are, have, a, we have a high and holy calling to live above the mess. The Bible is full of instruction about how we ought to treat one another, and it speaks time and time again, kindness and mercy and grace and forgiveness and love and restoration and all these principles. And we know it's hard, but we're still called to it. That's who we're supposed to be. And our transformation ought to so impact those around us that we start a movement, that we start a wave like ripples in the pond that impacts the entire world. I want to show you a couple of things that perhaps can help us see it in a new way. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I, my throat, my voice may not make it to the end of this. In fact, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry. So a couple of weeks ago, I refinished the dining room table at our house. We've had that table for maybe 20 years, and it was kind of dull and kind of scratched, and it looked like, looked like somebody had been eating off it for 20 years. So it was time. So I got some of this. Clean Strip Premium Furniture Stripper. 
and I poured it on the table. I'm not going to do that to the pulpit. The trustees would have a heart attack. And I get a brush and you spread it out. You put a nice thick coat on the furniture. And you wait about 15 minutes and you get your putty knife and the finish, the, the shiny bit, it just peels right off. And you scrape and you scrape and you scrape and you can take the whole layer of your varnish or urethane or whatever it is, peels it right off, it all goes away. You probably want to wear gloves when you do that. Because what this does to your furniture, it will also do to your skin if you leave it on there for too long. It is very caustic. A caustic product. So after the tabletop was all stripped off and I got the sandpaper and sand, 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 sand for hours on end, then I got some of this. Minwax fast drying polyurethane. Put three or four nice smooth coats of this on, sand it smooth, polish it up, and it makes a beautiful hard surface on the wood. It brings out all the beauty in the grains. This is a constructive product. It builds up the layer, so it's nice and durable. This is a destructive product. It takes away. So my question for you, my friends, which are you? Which are you? Are you caustic or are you constructive? We're going to go to the Bible in Romans chapter 12. Romans is a fascinating book. The first 11 chapters of Romans is great theology, and Paul talks a lot of good explanation about the whys and hows of our salvation, and he talks about sin and grace. He talks about the nature of God, the love of God, the person of Jesus Christ. He talks about how all this is by faith, and by faith it is accounted to us as righteousness, and by faith in Christ alone we receive all that God has in store for us. That's the first 11 chapters. And then at chapter 12, he makes a sharp right-hand turn and goes in a whole new direction. And it's no longer the theological or the conceptual, but it becomes very practical. The day in and day out of how we ought to live and who we ought to be in order to practice this transformation. We have that profound statement in verse 2. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you would prove and demonstrate and show the world what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And if we think about God's big plan for redemption in this world, God's desire to see humanity know him and be saved, you and I are connected in this web of relationships. You and I have influence in the world to some extent. And as we practice transformation, that makes a difference in the life of my neighbor. And then my neighbor's life becomes transformed, and that makes a difference in his neighbor's life. We have influence, like the ripples in the pond. The one stone drops in, and it spreads out all across. So Paul gives us some words about how we can make that bit of influence that we have to be constructive rather than caustic. Amen? We're going to begin at verse 9, go through verse 13. Would you stand, please, that we would order the reading of God's word. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, con continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Father God, help us see with clarity, with purpose, with meaning, who we shall be in this world. Help us, Lord, to see how our actions impact those around us. Help us to be faithful to your call, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. <laughs> Now, 
we are all in this together. We are all here together. In your family, you're connected. In our church, in our workplace, in our schools, in our community, we're in it together. We are related through these network of, of friendships and acquaintances. We need that. It is important for us to have those relations. We are social creatures. We do better in the group than we do by ourselves. Time and time again, I have shared with you that your relationships matter the most. The people in your lives are the most valuable asset you have. And if we want to live good and healthy lives, we want to have good and healthy relationships. And these verses from Paul tell us exactly how we can do that. These words are for us. My wife and I were on a bicycle ride a couple of weeks ago. We went on the Route 9 trail up by the Home Depot, and it goes out towards Martinsburg along Route 9. You've seen it there. If you're not aware of it, they're doing some kind of construction along the trail, putting in drainage ditches or pipes or whatever. And so when we got to Lee Town Road, the trail was closed all the way up to the Coast Guard station. Trail closed. Keep out, construction zone, hard hats required. So what did we do? Right past the sign and down the trail. It was late in the day, there was nobody around, I figured no big deal. Well afterwards I felt kind of foolish about that. And I knew I shouldn't have done that, because if that sign was put there, it was put there exactly for people like me. Don't go up the trail because there's stuff up there. We don't want you to mess with this. Keep out. This means you. Probably not the best sermon illustration to tell you how I disobeyed to try to get you all to obey. But it's the best I could think of. This means you. These words from Paul, he is talking to us. And we have no right to exempt ourselves or give ourselves a free pass. Well, I'm not doing that because it's hard. We got to do these things because our lives have impact. And our actions have impact in the lives around us. And if we practice transformation the way we ought to, we will be very constructive in life. And if we fail to practice transformation, we're going to be caustic and toxic and destructive. Look at verse 9. Two powerful thoughts in this verse. First, about the genuine character of love. And secondly, about clinging to what is right and good and getting away from those actions that are detrimental. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Let your love be genuine, authentic, real, and true. Hypocrisy is a falseness. It is a double-mindedness. It is a lack of truth and authenticity. In fact, the original word hypocrite in the original language of Greek, it was an actor on a stage, somebody who was play-acting, making it look a certain way, that was a hypocrite. Hypocritical love is the kind of love that comes with an agenda. Love with an ulterior motive. Love that is given to you that ultimately will be a benefit to me. Like how you have a little extra love for that rich uncle and you kind of ignore all your poor relations. You're looking for the benefit for the self. That's not love. That's self-centered acting. Let your love be without hypocrisy, let it means let it be genuine and authentic. No pretense. We know the Bible talks about love time and time again. We know that the whole book is full of the love of God and the love we ought to have for one another. Love is the ultimate test of our faith. Jesus said it. By this, the world is going to know if you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. And in every case in Scripture, love is spoken of not merely good feelings and the warm and fuzzies. Love is what we do. 
Love is how we interact. Love is an action, not an idea. Let it be done with the kind of unconditional love that God has for us. And let us share that with the world around us. And then, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Flee, walk away from, run, refuse to participate the evil and the bad and that which we know is against God's will. Cling to, pursue, embrace, hold fast to that which is right and good and proper in God's sight. Acting without love, a hypocritical love, or pursuing those things that we know are wrong are always going to be caustic for ourselves and for those that we are in these relationships with. Much rather to be genuine, constructive, and authentic in all these activities. Verse 10 continues with, be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. <laughs> In the late 1970s, there was a musician who was what we call a one-hit wonder. A fellow named Nick Lowe had a song. It was a good song. Got some radio time. He sold a bunch of records. And then he was never heard from again. One-hit wonder. Nick Lowe's song was called, some of you are going to smile because you'll remember it, Cruel to be Kind. You've got to be cruel to be kind in the right measure. And the song talked about the heartbreak and the hurt that he was experiencing in his relationship. And he was asking, why do you say you got to be cruel to be kind? Because this certainly doesn't feel like love. Cruel to be kind is a lie. You got to be kind to be kind, don't you? You got to be kind to be kind. And cruel and harsh and critical and mean spirited is always caustic. It is always destructive. If we're going to be constructive in our relationships, if we're going to do some good in the world, kindness and respect and courtesy will always go further, is always more beneficial. What's the old saying? You catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. You remember that, right? Catch more flies with honey. No? Don't remember that one? <clears throat> in our world today, kindness and dignity and respect seem to be an awful short supply, don't they? Our esteemed and elected officials in the big city to the east of here have neglected these principles, and they set the tone for our culture, and it's hack, 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 and attack, attack, attack. And so the news media gets on there and capitalizes and gets a Democrat and a Republican on a split screen and kind of stirs them up and they start yelling at each other. And the whole nation sees that. And these how our, our dignified and elected leaders treat each other, so that must be okay for me to treat people that way. And so we get on the Facebook and the social media and just start wailing away and attack and criticize and rip and tear each other down with no consideration whatsoever about the damage we do in the lives of the people who receive that. If we are going to be constructive rather than caustic, simple things like kindness, courtesy, respect for people, consideration of the feelings of one another are always going to be necessary. I don't, know, I don't know what your grandma told you. One of the things my grandma told me, good manners never go out of style. Good manners never go out of style. Verse 11 continues on, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. If you have a King James version of the Bible, the first part of this verse reads, not slothful in business. I like that. And it gives the sense of not being lazy, not being haphazard or 
careless in our affairs, but rather be diligent and attentive and intentional and deliberate about how we interact with one another. Paying attention to how our actions, attitudes impact the people around us because it matters. The caustic person is always careless, pays no heed to how he treats people or how people respond to him, but the constructive person is always deliberate in trying to build others up and treating people with dignity and, dignity and courtesy. You know that human beings are the only part of creation that are created in the image of God. We, created in the image of God, and that means something. We are the pinnacle of his creation. We are his most valuable possession. God loves people. And we best serve God when we serve his people. And when we treat one another as special creations. And this verse is saying is, hey, pay attention. Be aware of how your actions impact the people in your circle. Two verses from 1 John amplify this. If you say that you're in the light but you live with hate, that ain't the light. My little children, let us love not in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. When John is talking about love or hate, He's not talking about your feelings. He's talking about what you do and how you speak to people and how you interact one to another. And if you act hatefully with meanness and spite and a cold heart, if you are destructive, that is the darkness of the world being made manifest in you. Love is always constructive. Love always seeks to bless and encourage and edify the other. Back to Romans 12. We'll look at verses 12 and 13. I see in here about four points, and I'm just going to touch them briefly. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, and distributing to the needs of the saints. The whole sermon, as you have figured out, is based on the principle versus the opposite of the principle. Words and antonyms, okay? The word of God, the truth of God, the principle of God is always constructive. And the opposite of that is always destructive. How are you being constructive? How are you adding hope and, and generosity and patience? Are we building up or are we tearing down? Hope always builds up. Hope always contributes we have such a blessed hope in Christ because of this faith. We have such a hope in God and this confident expectation that he will do what he says he will do. And if we have that hope, what's the opposite? What's the antonym of hope? Despair? Disbelief? Doubt? Pessimism? So when we interact one to another, what are you looking for in somebody else's life? Are you looking for the worst or are you looking for the best? Are you hoping that they will have all those characteristics or are you looking for the ways that they're going to fail you? Where's your hope? We are called to patience in the difficulties, patience in the tribulations, and that calm endurance, that persevering spirit, knowing that God will be work and fulfill his plans no matter what comes our way. The caustic person, the destructive person, has a hard time with patience. He wants immediate gratification. He wants the instant answer. I want it all and I want it now. Give it to me. The constructive person is willing to endure step by step, awaiting God's blessing. Paul talks about continuing steadfastly in prayer, and I was thinking about what, what character trait best describes that. What in us is most prayerful, and what I came up for this sermon anyway, was a spirit of humility. Our prayerful reliance on God, our continual 
seeking after God is a confession that I cannot do it on my own. And I don't have all the answers. And I need him and I am helpless without him. And that cultivates humility in me and it kills off my arrogance and it kills off my pride and self-centeredness and helps me to stay centered in God's will. And if you spend any time with arrogant or self-centered people, you know how caustic they can be. You know how hard they are to be around much more constructive to practice humility and pursue that that blessed presence of God. And then in verse 13, practicing generosity, living with generosity. And the implication here is certainly about wealth and material goods and meeting those needs of the people around us. But in context and in relation to all the rest of this passage, it's not just our material wealth, it's sharing our heart, sharing our time, sharing our love, sharing mercy, sharing forgiveness, not simply giving things, but giving of ourselves to be a blessing to the people around us. Those who are stingy or greedy with time, with self, with grace, that always takes away that always damages relationships. Much better to be constructive and generous in who we are. So, I ask again, which are you? Constructive or caustic? Are you adding to or are you taking away in your relationships? And you know, Paul gives us a pretty high calling in these verses, and I recognize that it's a challenge, and it's difficult to do this all the time. I think most of us will say, yes, we're a little bit of both. Because nobody is just one thing. And we are all many things in many ways. And sometimes we're doing great and sometimes we're not so much. But if we recognize the extent to which our lives are intertwined, and if we have an awareness of how this network of relationships impacts the world, we re- we got to see, we've got a solemn obligation to give of our best, to be at our best self, more constructive, less destructive. Not simply for our own sake, but for the sake of the people that we care about for the sake of the kingdom and the purposes of the kingdom. And you're, you, know, you know it's hard. I know it's hard. And very often when we go out to share mercy and grace and hope, the world turns around and kicks us in the shins. You go to forgive somebody and they take advantage. You express kindness and they come back with mean, hard and cruel. And I know that. I get it. And I think Paul knew that and understood it too because as soon as he finished these verses, look at verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. (laughs) Ooh! Bless those who persecute you. And when they come after you and treat you mean, bless them anyway. And if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live at peace with all men. You see... These words that Paul gives us, he's not writing to the rest of the world. He's writing to us. He's writing to the Christ followers. This means you. A high and holy calling to live with purpose, to live with intention to build up and not to tear down. See, if the world is ever going to be a better place, it's going to start with people like us. If the world is ever going to come back from the brink of destruction, it's going to start because people start loving again and caring again and treating each other with dignity and respect. We have the calling to initiate the good and healthy and positive relationship. Starts with us. And I know how hard it is. We're all interconnected. 
And if we buy into the idea of six degrees of separation, we realize that my transformation matters. And that, has a different, that makes a difference in my neighbor's life. And then that'll make a difference in the next life and the next life. And we can be constructive rather than caustic. In our immediate circle, that's, gonna, that's the start of how we change the world. And if there's going to be any hope, if there's going to be any turning around, if God is gracious to us, he'll give us a little bit of time to enable us. So on my challenge to you today, my friends, start the movement. Start the movement. And let's build something great while we still can. Amen? Father God, we thank you for your word and your truth and your grace. And we pray your blessings to flow upon us. We pray, Lord, that we would know you, serve you. We pray, Lord, that we would be the kind of people you need us to be on this earth and that your kingdom's cause would continue on for your sake and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to close our time together with a hymn of invitation and as a chance for you to respond to whatever God is doing in your life. And the altar will be open for prayer for whatever you're struggling with today. I invite you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I invite you to confess your sins before him, receive him as your Savior, follow him as your Lord, and know what it means to be a participant in the eternal life of God. Would you stand with us, please? If you have a need, if you have a burden, you come now. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.